All right, hello everybody. Um, welcome to this special uh, lecture. Um, today, our speaker is Joel Corbo. Um, he's a senior research assistant, uh, sorry, senior research associate for the Center for STEM Learning at the University of Colorado Boulder. Uh, his, his work focuses on implementing and studying mechanisms for improving undergraduate education in STEM departments with a particular focus on organizational institutional change, equity and inclusion, and community. Um, as a graduate student, he helped found and lead the Berkeley Compass Project. <laughs> Woo, that's us. <laughs> Uh, which is uh, we're a student run organization dedicated to supporting students from marginalized groups in physics. And he co leads the Access Network, which is a national network of student centered equity programs inspired by Compass. Uh, before coming to CU, CU Boulder, uh, Joel received, received his bachelor's degree in physics from MIT and a PhD in physics from UC Berkeley. Um, as a member of the Whaley Group at Berkeley, he studied ultra-cold ultra atomic gases using quantum Monte, Monte Carlo simulation techniques, and um, he is here today to uh, speak about what he's doing now. So let's give a warm welcome to our speaker, Joel Corbo. All right, I have unmuted. Hopefully folks online can hear me. Um, yeah, thanks for the invitation, everybody. Um, as I was saying to folks earlier today, I was just sort of walk, wandering around Berkeley and around campus and having all sorts of memories <laughs> and emotions, um, most of them good. Uh, so, so yeah, it is, uh, it is nice to be back and nice to see uh, that Compass is still a thing that exists and is, you know, carrying on the work and, and doing lots of good stuff around here. Um, all right, so, um, yeah, I guess another thing, just for a relatively small group, it looks like both on Zoom and in person. So like if folks wanna interrupt with questions and whatever, that's totally fine. I uh, I will not probably monitor the chat. So if somebody else, Donnie's got that, okay, great. So if stuff comes up in the chat, let me know. Um, yeah, so I guess my um, path has been a little bit windy. Uh, I was a grad student here at Berkeley um, from 2004 to 2013, so I was like a ninth and a half year by the time I graduated. Um, and, you know, at the time I um, was actually on my third advisor by the time I graduated and sort of bounced around among a bunch of different areas of physics and ultimately, you know, upon leaving grad school, made the transition away from traditional physics, uh, more in the direction of science education sort of stuff as I transitioned into my postdoc at CU Boulder. Um, and that's sort of where uh, all of the rest of this, I'm gonna turn my video off. That's sort of where all the rest of um, this work that sort of emerged from that point. It really was, um, I would say honestly in, in large part, or in, at least in part inspired by stuff that I was doing with Compass, right? This idea that you know, higher ed is great in a lot of ways, but it also has a lot of problems um, that need to be fixed. And, you know, we're the people who are here who can, who can do that. And so I think that was a lot of my um, sort of drive towards switching into this area of trying to figure out, like, how do we improve higher education and, and make some of the changes that, that I think, you know, and that many, many folks think need to be made. So that's sort of the context. Um, uh, and so now I'll just sort of launch into it. Um, so yeah, it turns out that making change is hard. <laughs> um, you know, folks have been trying to uh, fix all sorts of things about all sorts of human structures, uh, including higher ed for a very long time. Um, and yet there's still a lot of work to be done. Uh, so hopefully this is not a surprising set, uh, uh, idea. Um, but you know, I wanted to dig before before launching into the rest of this. Dig a little more into well, why? Like, what are some of the things that makes makes change hard? And in particular, what makes change hard to sustain? Right? What is it that that causes all of these change efforts and all of this good work that people try to do to fail sometimes? Um, and there's all sorts of reasons. So this is just sort of a, a, a list, kind of you know of of uh, a handful among many. Um, so if you have some sort of change effort that relies too much on like external support or temporary resources, that's that can be a pretty fragile thing, right? So let's imagine 
that you've gotten a grant to do some really great thing and then the grant money runs out and now there's no more money to pay people to do the great thing anymore, right? So um, that's that's a good way for uh, a really positive thing to just sort of die because there's no support to sustain it any longer. Um, lots of folks try to um, uh, think about change as something that's initiated from the top of an organization, right? Because um, I think we're really familiar with very hierarchical sort of organizational structures, right? Where the leader just gets to like say what it is that's gonna happen and everybody is expected to follow along. I mean, in practice, that usually doesn't work very well, um, especially in, in an organization like higher ed, which is not very hierarchical in that sort of same way where you just have to follow orders, right? That's not a higher ed sort of, sort of thing that happens. Um, Lots of change efforts don't ever think about sustainability. So how are we gonna how are we gonna keep this thing going in the long term? It's all very focused on the present and what do we need to do right now to keep moving forward? But like it's sort of you know never thinking about the long term. Um, this is a big one. So change efforts um, that don't account for what are what's the sort of values and beliefs that underlie an organization. Like if you try to to create a change that goes against some of the like deeply held values of an organization, that's also pretty likely to fail because you're not gonna, because that stuff is very, very strong and hard to change. Um, and this last one is the idea that even if you do do something that makes a positive change, um, today's solutions are tomorrow's problems. That's a little sort of aphorism uh, that goes along with this, right? So. Something might work today, but is not going to necessarily work down the road. And that's also something that people sort of forget about. So these are just some off the top of my head kind of reasons or, or things to think about as to why change efforts often don't work. Uh, and so my focus since grad school has been around this whole big area of thinking about change in higher education, both from the sort of research perspective. So like trying to understand more deeply and theorizing about how change happens and then going and sort of studying um, you know, interviewing people and so on to try to understand how in practice it happens. Um, so that's the sort of research piece, but also the practice piece. So going in there and actually supporting departmental change. And for me, both of those, that sort of research and practice piece are very tied together. Um, I've never sort of been interested in research sort of in a vacuum for its own sake. And so you'll see as I as I go through the, the rest of this presentation, it's gonna be, it's gonna be in both worlds, right? Like the actual how to, how to support this change, and then also some of the, the studying of that, that that we've done, that me and the folks I've worked with have done. Um, all right, so the first piece of this I wanted to talk about is these things um, uh, called departmental action teams. So this is um, essentially a model for how to support change in university departments that me and a whole bunch of other folks back in 2014 uh, came up with and sort of implemented first at University of Colorado and then sort of spread to some other institutions and is now being picked up at a variety of places around the country in different ways. Um, so at the really basic level, um, get rid of this box. So at a really basic level, um, the departmental action team is a departmentally based working group of maybe six to 10-ish people. Uh, faculty members, staff members, and students uh, in a department with two main goals. Um, so one is to create change around some broad scale undergraduate education issue with a focus on sort of departmental structure and culture. So like sort of these deeper level pieces, not just the surface level stuff. Uh, and then the other is to help the participants in the DAT. So the folks actually doing this work become better change agents, sort of become better uh, at creating change in the future. Um, and so, like I said before, I was one of the originators of this model um, back at CU Boulder back in the day, uh, me along with Dan Reinholtz, who actually was also a Berkeley grad student, but in the math department. Um, we were both postdocs together at, uh, at CU Boulder uh, on the same project, and we sort of came up with this model and then brought a whole bunch of other people on board the, the project and it sort of grew a bunch um, from that point. So um, I wanted to focus in at first a little bit about on like that practice piece. So what is it uh, that me and Dan and the other folks on this project were doing? Um, and so we essentially would act as the external facilitators for these teams. Uh, and essentially what that, 
you know, the one sentence version of what that meant is that our jobs were to create an environment in which these teams were likely to achieve success at whatever goal it was or whatever change they were trying to make. Uh, and so in practice, what that meant is that we would do things like manage the logistics for these teams, right? So make sure that notes were getting taken and organize Google Drives and send reminder emails and, you know, make sure there were meeting agendas, like all of this basic stuff that's necessary for a group to function and for meetings to function well, but that people often like forget about as, you know, being a thing that you actually have to have to do. Um, Another piece that we focused a lot on, and I'll get into more detail about what this means in a little bit, is helping the team become high, highly functional, right? So we had this concept that the team, like that a team, in order to be a productive team, you have to be thinking about the health of the team as a whole, that it's not just about a bunch of individuals, but how is everybody working together and that that doesn't just magically happen, like that there's ways that you cultivate productive group functioning. Uh, so that's sort of the second bullet. The third bullet was around um, making sure that we're providing support that's customized to whatever the team's goals were. So for example, let's suppose that we had a group that really wanted to uh, figure out how to assess student learning across the major, right? And so now, now think about it, this might be a group of folks from a biology department or from a po political science department where this is not their area of expertise, right? And so part of our job was then to come in and be like, okay, well, you guys want to work on a uh, curriculum develop or, or a curricular assessment, right? So we might not be deep experts in that, but we have at least some amount of educational um, research expertise and we know who else on campus we could bring into conversations about this to bring in that knowledge of, okay, how do you go about effectively creating like assessments or how do you effectively go about like um uh you know shifting climate issues in the department you know to make it more friendly for women and students of color etc so whatever their issue was we didn't necessarily we either brought in the expertise ourselves related to that issue or we figured out like who out in the community we could pull in to support the group um and then the last piece is really about essentially acting as a cheerleader for the group. So being able to go out to different deans on campus or you know, other sort of people in positions of authority and power around the university and be like, hey, those people over in religious studies are doing this really great thing. You should support them, et cetera, right? So like trying to use our own position in the university to elevate the work of that group. So that was sort of what our job, that, that sort of is, was our job as facilitators for these teams. These, this was the sort of stuff that we were doing. Um, and I think one of the valuable things about us essentially, you know, being paid to do this kind of thing is that it's not going to happen unless it's explicitly somebody's job, right? Like most of these are things that you might be like, oh yeah, this is really important, but nobody does it unless, unless you know, just sort of randomly. Um, all right. So then in terms of a little more about what the structure of these groups look like, um, membership, like I said before, about six to 10 people. Once you get more than 10, the group gets kind of unwieldy. So that's, you know, that's a reasonable upper bound. Um, people typically from a single department, um, but we always wanted there to be a diversity of roles. So faculty members, tenure track, non-tenure track, grad students, undergrads, staff members, uh, maybe advisors, um, sometimes alumni. There might be all sorts of all sorts of people. But the idea was that, you know, if if uh, anybody who sort of has a stake in the undergraduate education mission of the department should be at the table um, because they all sort of are impacted and have a unique perspective. Um, and then to the extent possible, of course, we would always want like diversity of demographics, perspectives, et cetera. Some of that would sometimes be hard. As you can imagine, depending on the discipline, it might be harder to get different, different sorts of um, demographic diversity, but we would sort of do our best. Um, typically these groups, we would meet with them roughly every other week for like 60 minutes at a time. Um, and typically we would meet, we would work with the same department for at least one academic year. And usually they'd want us to go longer. So we typically would go for two, sometimes we would even go to like two and a half or so. Um, the area of focus that they would focus on would be, like I said, some issue related to undergraduate education. Um, 
And I'll get into some examples in I think the next slide of what, what those look like. Um, but one really key thing is that whatever the area of focus of the group was, it was something that was at least chosen by the participants or at least refined by the participants if not outright chosen. So the idea was not that we were coming in as outsiders and being like, hey, we've looked around your department and this is what you're doing wrong, <laughs> right? And so this is what you need to work on to fix. Like nobody wants to hear that from us, right? Um, similarly, the idea was not for the department chair to be like, hey, you, you, and you, I'm volunteering the three of you to go do this work, right? Because again, people are not gonna be invested in something that they have not, um, sort of developed from the ground up. And so for us, it was really important that whatever it is that the group was, was tackling, that the members of the group were the ones who decided what that would be and what the issue is that they want to address. So yeah, we came in with no preconceptions other than that it had to had do with undergraduate education. And like probably if a group was like, actually what we want to do is be even stronger gatekeepers than we already are, we would have probably been like, that's nice, we're not going to work with you. So there are like some lines that we would have drawn, but in practice, it never got to that point. Um, and ideally, these groups would have a positive relationship with the department, at least a supportive chair, because you need people in power to support change efforts, um, and mechanisms for like cultivating allies in the department and so on. All right, so here's a giant table uh, that you shouldn't worry too much about the details, but essentially the, the point of this is just to show you the breadth of the different sorts of departments that we worked with. Um, across both CU Boulder and Colorado State University. Um, I think there's something like 17 departments listed there or something like that. You can see there's some engineering, there's some natural sciences, math is in there, we have some social sciences, we have some humanities departments. So we really sort of span the gamut. This is definitely not a physics thing or even a STEM thing, even though uh, the National Science Foundation was paying the bills, so we mostly stuck with STEM but we managed to sneak some money from the university in there so that we could expand to other disciplines too. Uh, and then the second and third columns are just examples of the different kinds of change efforts that departments that we work with engaged in. So when, when I say broad scale issue, that's the kind of stuff I'm talking about. So, you know, developing a skills assessment or an, an assessment plan for the whole major, um, you know, ensuring that there's that there's coordination among the different classes in the major. So people aren't just teaching any old random thing and nothing is connected to anything else. Um, uh, improving undergraduate employability, um, developing a sort of set of learning outcomes for the major, uh, improving the experience of underrepresented students from underrepresented groups, um, improving like physical student spaces in the department. Um, uh, developing a peer mentoring program. So, so it's, it's big picture things, right? It's not like, oh, let's figure out how to add a new homework assignment to physics 201. Like that, that's not the appropriate scale for a group like this. Um, and these are all like, this is not just made up examples. These are all actually things that one group or another did. We're just not connecting them to preserve some amount of anonymity for, for the departments we work with. Yeah. Can I, can I ask like some examples of how you would implement some sort of assessment plan in a uh, higher education structure where professors come in with all different backgrounds about what they would want to like teach? Can you repeat the question? Oh, yes. Uh, so the question was sort of um, uh, like, how is it that you would come, that you would actually in practice develop a, an assessment plan across the major given that faculty members all have their own ideas about they want to teach this, that, and the other? Yeah, it's hard. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't think that, so I didn't facilitate that particular DAT, but from what I remember, it took them a long time. I mean, I think that they probably, actually there was two different departments that did this. And for both of them, it took them, it was this iterative process where the T, like the DAT itself would do a bunch of thinking about like one step of the process. So like, you know, maybe starting out by mapping what even the learning goals are across the major. And then there would be a process of going back to the rest of the department, which really means the faculty. That's what we actually mean by the department, right? So going back to the faculty at some faculty meeting and being like, hey, this is the sort of structure that we've come up with. Give us some feedback. They get some feedback, hopefully constructive. And then they go back and do some iteration. And then so it's this process of, of sort of going back and forth that needs to happen um, that I think was a big piece of what helped that stuff move along in a successful way. 
Um, because that helps people feel like their concerns are being taken into account and not just feel like it. I mean, they should legitimately be taken into account, right? Um, and it also helps make it so that nobody's taken by surprise. Um, so a different failure mode that I didn't talk about earlier is the group that does phenomenal work in a corner for a year and then suddenly comes back to the rest of the department or to whomever else in authority and is like, hey, we've spent the whole last year coming up with this big, beautiful, wonderful plan. But then the rest of the department's like, wait, what? Who told you you could work on this? I never heard about this. Why wasn't I involved? I never got asked about this. Like, blah, 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 blah. And then it's all about poking holes instead of like taking the work that was done sort of for what it was, right? Um, so having that regular communication, I think is one of the most important pieces of that. Okay, um, so this, so that is all probably still super abstract. Um, so I wanted to sort of have a way of being a little more concrete about, okay, if you were part of one of these groups, what would like the life cycle look like? Like what would, how would you go from like one step to another to, to get to some change process? Um, so first step, and I should also say, I'm talking about these as though they're steps in a numerical order, but that is a model. Uh, in fact, the process is super nonlinear. You don't actually step through things one at a time. It's not that neat and tidy, but you know, whatever, we're physicists, right? So models are nice. We're just gonna pretend like it's all linear, even though that's not actually the case. Um, all right, so step one was assemble a diverse team. So I talked about that a little bit, right? The idea that the team really needs to involve stakeholders from across the department that are all um, impacted with and therefore have some amount of expertise around the issue that's, that's uh, that the group is going to tackle. Um, second thing we always try to do with these groups was support them in a process of developing a shared vision. So the idea here is let's all come together and come to consensus on what is the thing that we are trying to create or to bring about, right? What is the end state that we're trying to get to? Um, and there's all sorts of reasons why this idea of shared vision is important. Uh, but one of the most important ones is that by having this sort of shared goal that everybody is driving towards, assuming that it is legitimately shared by everybody, it can help to sort of uh, bring the group together so that even when there's a disagreement that comes up where, you know, person A thinks we should do X and person B thinks we should do Y, hopefully they both still agree about where we're trying to get to. And that can be a sort of thing that brings them together, even though they're disagreeing in the moment about what exactly we need to be doing right now. Um, this is also as opposed to like, often people talk about having an outcome focus versus a problem focus. Um, so the problem focus version of this would be to say, what we're trying to do is to eliminate a thing that exists that we don't want to exist as opposed to what we wanna do is create a new thing or bring about something new. Um, and that's just a sort of shift in mentality that is also can matter a lot in the sort of product productivity of a group um, to be focused on like a future you wanna bring about rather than just some shit in the present that you're trying to get rid of. Um, all right. Vision is really important, but visions are these big grandiose things um, that has to be focused down into actual concrete goals that are achievable, right? If you guys have heard of SMART goals, um, that is a, that's one framework that we sometimes use. But the idea is just that like, you need to get to the point where you have very concrete goals that you're trying to pursue that are, that are very clearly defined. Um, it's not enough to just have some big picture sort of vision that's, that's very amorphous. All right, so that's sort of steps two and three are what I like to call where are we going. Uh, step four is sort of a different piece, which is where are we now? Um, so this is the piece where one actually goes about and tries to figure out what is the current state of the, of the department with respect to whatever issue. So let's suppose that we're worried about um, recruiting new students to our major because the physics, you know, we're in a department where the major has been shrinking over time. Uh, and so people might have all sorts of stories about like, oh, the reason why the number of majors is decreasing is because 
of this thing that the legislature did. Or the reason why is because, um, uh, I don't know, they haven't built a new bouncy wall on a uh, bouncy uh, pit on campus yet, right? <laughs> like who knows? But the point, the point is that people have all of these stories that they tell about, oh, the reason why X is true is Y. But if you actually dig, there's no evidence. <laughs> underlying that, right? It's just like some gut reaction kind of feeling or conventional wisdom. And so what we really try to support these dats, these teams in doing is getting beyond that and saying like, okay, maybe it's true that the reason why students aren't coming here anymore is because they really want a bouncy castle. But can we go like collect data that shows us that that's the case? Like maybe we should do some focus groups with students and ask them what they think about bouncy castle, castles, right? Um, or maybe we should run a survey, or maybe we should see if other universities that do have bouncy castles, if they get more students than we do, right? But the, po the point is that like, it's fine to have these ideas about what might be happening, but we have to go and actually figure out, is there, is there evidence to support this or not? Um, and incidentally, both of these pieces are pieces that teams that, that Many, many, many people will jump into trying to create change by immediately jumping to doing something. Well, there's sort of two failure modes. One is the failure mode of like talking to death and never actually trying to do anything and just spinning your wheels. The other thing that often happens is that a group will just immediately jump to, we need to do X, but we haven't figured out what it is we're trying to do. We haven't figured out what the current situation is. And so there's no reason why you should believe that X is the thing that's gonna get you from here to there when you don't even know where here and there are. Right, so that's sort of the reason why we always start with this kind of where are we going piece and the where are we now piece. And then the rest of the process is the how do you get there piece. So once we're pretty clear on the current state of things and we're clear about where we're trying to go, then we can think about what is the what are some projects or some actual activities we can do or changes that we can make that, that will get us there. And then we can carry those things out. And then we can do another thing which people often forget to do, which is actually assess whether the thing we did got us closer to our goal or not. Um, and so that's the sort of like, what a lot of people I think would call the carrying out the change effort steps five and six, but actually all of these other pieces are super important too. And then we usually encourage groups once they've sort of gone through the cycle to take a step back and think about, okay, we had some goals, we did some stuff, we did some assessment to figure out whether we moved closer to our goals, where are we now? Like, do we wanna keep doing the things we're doing? Do we need to change course, et cetera? So this sort of like, let's step back and reflect and figure out where we need to go next. Um, and so when we think about the, the work of this team, pretty much all of the steps on that previous diagram fall into this sort of overarching category of carrying out the change effort, what somebody might sort of naively think of as what it means to like engage in a change effort. So that's basically all of those things. Um, but a thing that we found in working with departments and a thing that you know we found by reading the change literature, um, which is like a hundred years old, there's like a century of, of literature on how you create change in organizations um, is that that's not the only that's that's not the only thing that a productive team or a healthy team works on. So that's one piece. Another piece that's really important, which I touched on a little bit earlier, is the idea of focusing on how do we make the team high functioning. Um, so what are all of the things that we need to worry about to make sure that this is a healthy group? And so that's things like uh, making sure that the team. Uh, is diverse, right? So we're not just a monoculture. Um, being really explicit about what are the norms of this group? Like what is it that is acceptable behavior and not acceptable behavior? And what are the standards that we're holding each other accountable to? Um, being really clear about structures, like how do we make decisions? How often are we gonna meet? How do people communicate? Who is setting the agendas? Who is taking notes? What does all of that stuff mean, right? So being really clear about all of that knowing how to effectively manage conflict, um, knowing how to effectively manage power differentials, right? Especially in a group where you have students and staff participation, right? So you have people lower down on the hierarchy, figuring out how to make sure that they feel sort of safe and equal participants in the group. Um, and then things like how do you motivate people and how do you encourage participation? Because this work is hard and it's long and it takes a long time and some people are busy and you know there has to be something that's keeping people emotionally invested in the work. Um, this stuff is 
equally as important as actually doing the change effort. Um, but it's often neglected, right? And so we, we always try to like, really with the teams we work with, elevate all of these things as well and make sure that, that folks were learning about all of these, all of these um, issues as well as learning about how to actually carry out the change effort. Another important piece is, again, I sort of mentioned this before, this idea about building positive external relationships. So there's lots of ways to do that. That could look like gathering input from other people in the department, reporting back to other people in the department. So there's this communication happening, um, going around and cultivating allies, right? Which might be hallway conversations, going out to coffee with people, that sort of thing. Um, helping department members make sense of the change. So a lot of times resistance to change comes from people just not understanding like how their vision of how things work fits in with the change effort. So finding ways to help people do that sense making is really important. Um, and then interfacing with other units on campus. There's all sorts of people on campus with all sorts of information. Uh, admissions offices, institutional research offices, et cetera. And they're often really happy to help and provide the resources that they have um, if you find out the right person to ask and if you ask in a nice way, right? Um, so making sure that those relationships are being built was also really important. And then the last piece that we, that we really supported these groups with is the idea of supporting them in growing as change agents. Um, so helping them learn about different models of change uh, and, and different sort of theories for how you go about and create change. Uh, helping them learn about resources on campus, helping them learn how to, rep to recognize sort of opportunities to advance change. And then also these, these, this affect, right, the feelings, helping them feel more like they're capable of creating change and more motivated to create change. So from our perspective and the things that we sort of, you know, as we learned from, from working with these groups, across all those different departments is that all of these pieces are equally important. Like we you can't, it, to, for us, we would argue that you can't, you can't really engage in a successful change effort if you're neglecting any of these boxes. Um, so that's, I think, one, one sort of big message from, from the work that we've done is, is, is the idea that this is all sort of a, a, a system that works together. All right, um, so I wanted to give a couple of examples of specific uh, departments we worked with, but uh, I'm gonna use pseudonyms because we're trying to just protect the anonymity of our research subjects, right? So the potions department um, uh, is a department that was focused on improving the climate for students from marginalized backgrounds. So they were sort of one of these sort of traditional STEMI departments, right? Where there's sort of a lack of, of women and students of color and, um, uh, you know, first gen students and, and, and all those sorts of folks. Um, so that was really their big focus. Uh, that group, if I'm remembering right, they, we worked with them for about two years and then they've continued since that time to work independently. Um, but over the two years we worked with them, there were four faculty members involved one postdoc, two staff members, three grad students, and two undergrads. So it was a pretty big group. I don't, I don't think all of those people were there at all times. There were a few sort of people who swapped in and out. Um, but over those two years, they ended up doing a whole lot of stuff. Um, they created uh, two reports on like diversity and inclusion in the department. I mean, I think that they were the first people in the department to ever figure out like what fraction of the undergrads were women, right? So it was like, that level of ignorance, frankly, about what was even going on in the department. Um, uh, they started a monthly seminar series on equity and inclusion issues. Um, there was this really weird introductory honors course for the major that you had to be invited into. And so they sort of helped in shifting that so that it was a much more equitable sort of way to get into that course. They pushed for gender neutral bathrooms on in the department. Um, they created a welcome event for um, admitted students uh, with a focus on, you know, supporting students from underrepresented and marginalized groups. Um, and eventually they became a permanent committee in the department, which is how they've continued since that time. 
Um, and so this is a quote, uh, we interviewed a bunch of, I think we interviewed people from that, from that DAT multiple times over the, over the course of its existence. Uh, and so this was a quote from one of the faculty members um, who said, you know, comparing that team to a regular faculty committee, um, they thought it was really valuable to have both the undergrad and the grad students perspectives about their experience and what they really care about. Uh, and that that's been really valuable for shaping what they did. So that was pretty cool. Um, a second example, so the divination department, um, they were one of the ones who was interested in figuring out and having like a clear set of learning outcomes across their major, uh, which they didn't really hit like piecemeal, but they wanted something that was like, you know, overarching. Um, so again, nice diverse membership, two undergrads, a grad student, three tenure track faculty members, uh, two advisors, uh, and one staff member who I guess was not an advisor. Um, and they ended up again, I think over the course of two years, developing a set of department level student learning outcomes, aligning those outcomes with the different courses in the major, uh, and then developed a plan for collecting data to assess learning outcomes that was approved by the department. And again, I think that happened over the two years we worked with them. And I'm pretty sure that group persisted for at least a little while in collecting all of that data. And I think the last time we made contact with them, they were like getting into the process of analysis, but I don't think we talked to them since then. So I don't know where that went, uh, but hopefully in a positive direction. And again, we have a quote from a faculty member from that group. Um, this person was reflecting that the fact that we sort of provided them with different models for change, uh, that they wouldn't have seen that had they not been part of this, of, of the DAT project. Um, and that talking through the kinds of things we talked through with them was good because it allowed them to see how they function as a group and then how that would function with the department and then how to actually make the change happen. So I think, you know, this person is really reflecting about that these are concepts that they wouldn't have encountered otherwise, right? That it's not, nobody in higher ed is sort of, you know, faculty members are not trained in any of this stuff. Um, and so I think this person found it valuable that we were able to bring these ideas to them. Oof, and I am rapidly running out of time. So I'm gonna have to skip a whole bunch of stuff, which is fine. Um, all right, so um, one sort of really key piece of, of the DAT project um, is this set of core principles. So um, these are essentially a set of six concepts that for us, um, they serve to like two main purposes. One is they're sort of these design principles. So essentially they help us to, um, to ground, they essentially form a grounding for us so that when we're faced with a decision about how to run a group or how to, how to yeah, how to, how to, how to lead a group um, or, you know, when we were developing the model to begin with, we could always come back to these six things to say, okay, we need to make sure that whatever decision we make, it's upholding these ideas. Um, and at the same time, these also helped us to answer the question, what are the cultures that we want to bring about in a department? Because ultimately, you know, the immediate goal that we had was to support departments in making the change they wanted to make. But our sort of ultimate goal is that we want to shift the culture of higher ed. And so, um, but that begs the question towards what? Right. And this was essentially our answer to that question uh, is, you know, what is the culture that we're trying to bring about? Um, and so I could, you know, read these out, you know, first principle is the idea that students should be partners uh, in the educational process. Um, the idea that uh, whatever work it is that we're doing should be driving, again, this outcome focus right towards collective positive outcomes. Uh, that our decision making should be grounded in data connection, co collection and analysis and interpretation. Um, that collaboration should be enjoyable and productive, right? That, that we should feel good about working with each other. Um, that we're always trying to improve, right? This idea of continuous improvement um, and that whatever we do is grounded in a commitment to equity, inclusion and social justice. And there's a whole paper um, 
that the citation is down there and you can email me if you want to get a copy or whatever. It's uh, open, open access, so it's freely available. Um, that goes into uh, a lot of depth into each of these and sort of what we mean by them and the literature bases behind them and stuff like that. So, um, and I think it's a pretty accessible paper. So if it's something that, that you would be interested in, you should check it out. Um, I think that I will dive into one of them in a little more detail. Uh, and I wanted to focus on students as partners just because that's uh, one, a thing that I like to get on a soapbox about <laughs> uh, is the idea that, you know, students, uh, look, whatever, I helped to found Compass as a grad student, right? So clearly I believe that, that students can make change in the world and have really valuable things to contribute to, to all of these efforts. Um, and so when we say students are partners, essentially the, the, that concept for us is divided up into a bunch of different components, uh, which is what I've sort of listed out in this box. So that means that students have unique expertise, right? Like um, students are the ones who know what it is like to be a student at your particular institution today. Nobody else knows that. Um, and so that idea I think is really critical. That is a form of expertise. Um, which can often get discounted. Um, part of what it means for students to be partners in this work is that students have decision-making power, like legitimate decision-making power. Um, uh, and that beyond that, students and faculty, staff, et cetera, are sharing power in legitimate ways. Um, another important piece of this is the idea that students see themselves as partners. So a thing that we found occasionally in, in interviewing both faculty members and staff members and students in these teams is that you would often have a situation where a faculty member might see partnership where students don't see partnership um, for whatever reason, right? It, I mean, I think it, it's probably in many cases was as simple as it's harder to see hierarchy when you're at the top of it, right? And so for the faculty members, I think it was easier for them to envision the relationship as one of, of, uh, of true partnership than for the students who were still sort of seeing the hierarchy there. Um, so that sort of realization is what, or that hearing that from some of the students we worked with, I think was motivation for us to add that piece explicitly into this. And another thing that's, that is important is the idea that students are evolving and multifaceted, right? Like the idea that students today are the same as students 10 years from now is absurd. Um, so it's not enough to say, oh, well, we got a lot of input from students in 1987 <laughs> into the way that the department functioned, so we're fine now, right? Like, no, you need to be talking to students today. Um, and so some of the implications on the positive side for all of, the, all of these ideas uh, is the idea that, you know, students understand their own cultural background and experiences and history in a way that others don't. Um, and therefore students are best situated to understand how a change will impact them. Um, and it is also the case, uh, which is borne out in the literature and also stuff that, that we saw in practice, that participating in partnership um, really can increase a student's sense of motivation and confidence and belonging in the department. So, you know, for folks who are like, oh, well, this is taking time away from them doing their research or for that from them, like, you know, uh, taking their classes or whatever else, it's like, yes, perhaps it is, but there are other ways in which this is supporting students developing an identity as a chemistry major or as, a, you know, a sociology major or whatever it might be, right, where they're, where they're sort of deriving value from participating in this organization. Um, but there's also some uh, things that make this kind of thing challenging. So institutional structures exclude students, right? Like in general, it is not the norm for students to be on all sorts of committees and to be, you know, helping to make all sorts of decisions around university. Um, sort of in the example that I gave earlier is an example where, you know, student faculty partnerships can be really hard to do ethically. Like they require a lot of thought and hard work because again, there's a power imbalance. And there could be all sorts of things happening below the surface um, uh, that impact that relationship and that can potentially be harmful if it's not thought about really carefully. 
Um, and it also violates the sort of culture that faculty are the decision makers, right? So that also is a thing that, that makes this hard. So anyway, this is the kind of thing that, that that paper I talked about before does. We sort of break each principle down into these components and then think about like, what are the sort of affordances and of, of, of you know, aligning with that principle? And then what are the ways in which that's actually hard to do in practice? Um, one way that this comes out you know, in the way we design DATS is that we have students on all of our DATS. Um, we incentivize this with stipends um, to sort of demonstrate that we're valuing people's time. Um, and as facilitators, we would do things like revoice or affirm student ideas. Um, when people were deciding like what their homework would be, like who's gonna do what between now and the next meeting, we would, you know, try to make sure that there was equity and how those things were, you know, it wasn't just like the crappy jobs that students were assigned or whatever. Um, and that, you know, there was also equity in decision-making. And I really just love this quote from a student, I think from the potions that, um, uh, who was an undergrad, who was saying, who said in an interview that, you know, this person felt much more empowered uh, to know that even as an undergrad, their voice is represented in the department. It makes them feel like they want to get up and get off the couch and do all of this stuff, plan, organize, execute. Uh, and maybe the undergrads have a lot more energy. They haven't beaten it out of us yet. Uh, but I think we are kind of an untapped potential resource uh that it's at least good to have an open communication between all of these levels right so anyway, i i really appreciated uh, uh that particular quote so i'm totally out of time so we're just gonna skip 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 uh yeah sorry i always like over plan um i do want to call out the second quote on this slide so the two sentence version of this is that in partnership with the American Physical Society and the American Association of Physics Teachers, there's a new initiative that's launched where we are essentially training people from different physics departments to lead DATS in their own departments. We've run four groups of this type. Well, the third and fourth groups are currently running. Um, and we gave a survey to the first cohort at the end of their, experience, their year long experience um, and we asked them, how has this Leadership Institute impacted them? And I love the second quote. Uh, so Dolly, which was the name of the, in, the, of the Departmental Action Leadership Institute, has been tremendously influential in my professional life. For the first time, I am truly believing that my physics program is salvageable. I am motivated to bring my department back into a thriving state. I feel equipped and trained to lead this change. So anyway. Um, so I ended up skipping a lot, obviously, but I think still um, most of my takeaways, I, I think I ended up covering. Um, change is hard, but it's possible. Um, but it is also true that effective teams don't just like magically spring into existence. You have to do a lot of work to make sure that teams are, are, are effective and productive. And that's more than just carrying out some activities, right? There's all those other pieces I talked about. Um, academia trains people in how to be researchers, but not in things like how to teach, how to lead, how to build programs, how to create change, any of this other stuff, which sucks, but it is the world that we live in. Um, uh, but it's possible to build these skills, right? You might have to do a bunch of extra work, but it's still possible to do. Um, and I think I've really appreciated that we've been able to, that, that folks who we've worked with in all of these programs have really taken away some really key ideas, right? Again, my sort of uh, uh, soapbox uh, students as partners idea, uh, but also the idea that process matters, that you should spend time thinking about vision and outcome and goals before you go and make decisions, that you should do analyses before you act, all of this other stuff. Essentially be systematic about how you go about creating change. Don't just do random stuff and hope that it works. Um, Tons more information uh, on these websites. Um, and uh, the DAT project team also wrote a book, uh, which, um, yeah, is available wherever, wherever books are sold. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, we don't have an e copy of it yet. There was a whole drama with our design team where we didn't end up, um, we weren't able to, to get like a digital copy of it yet. One day we hope to. But for now, you can get it in hardcover and softcover. 
Um, and uh, lots of people gave us money, thanks to all of them. And, and I'll stop now, because the bells are chiming. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, I know it's after six, but I'm happy to stick around if folks have questions, including folks on Zoom. I can also hello, just hello. look okay. at the question. Um, so we have a question in the chat. Um, it's important that these these efforts are compensated, and I noticed that you had stipends set aside for students. How are faculty or postdocs compensated within the department? Were these efforts appreciated by the departments? For example, tenure packages. Yeah, yeah super super good question around compensation. Um, yes, so compensation meant different things for different people. Um, so we I talked about the student stipends um, for faculty members. Um, we add a, and this is part of the reason why getting the chair support was important. We at a minimum wanted it to be the case that whatever sort of credit the faculty service credit the faculty member would get for serving on whatever committees in their department, they were getting like equal credit for serving on on this on this group, even though it was not formally a department committee. Um, and you can argue about how valuable service credit is, but that's a different conversation. Um, the point was that, that we still wanted this thing to sort of count the same way as similarly positioned groups in the department. Um, so that was mostly, mostly uh, the faculty, you know, and that might mean that they got out of another committee assignment, for example, so it would free up some of their time. Um, for folks like um, staff members, we would try to make it sort of be the case that whatever work they would be doing for these teams would count as part of their like job responsibilities. So it's not like somebody has to spend their lunch break doing this stuff or whatever it is, right? But that whoever their supervisor was in the department knew this was a thing that was happening and has agreed that like, yes, your work as part of this team will count towards your job responsibilities and towards like raises and, you know, all of, all of whatever, whatever processes were already in place for um, evaluating people's job performances. Um, let's see. Question. Yeah, this business of the group that jumps to action too quickly and the one that talks and never acts, how do you avoid recover? I mean, I think that part of our motivation for trying to systematize this process by like developing a model with a particular name and like writing a whole book and all the rest of it was to have a structure kind of out there that people could learn about and use. I mean, I guess that if you if you have a group that already has gone down one of these two rabbit holes, I guess you would have to imagine that there's somebody in the group who recognizes that and is then trying to help the group recover from it which honestly will probably just be really frustrating for that person and they will probably get burned down and leave. <laughs> I think that that's like 99% of the time what would really what would really happen. Um, that said, I mean, it, it certainly is possible to recover from it. I think you would just need a person to step in who A, recognizes that this is what's happening, B, has enough authority to be able to, or, you know, pull with the group to be able to point this out um, and then to have enough sort of facilitation tricks up their sleeve to be able to like help the group get back into, into a, a productive space. But yeah, it's probably a hard thing to do. Um, oh, da -da -da, recorded video. Sure, yes, share, share as you like. I don't think I said anything too embarrassing. <laughs> Other questions, comments? Yeah. Can I ask one more question? I was just, so you approached heavily this DAT model for like, you know, implementing change. Yeah. What's an example of another type of model that people also have used? You know, what else? Like, I'm sure there's another type of model that's being funded that is. Yeah. Um, so the question was for the Zoom folks. Um, 
you know, we sort of developed the stat model as a particular way of making change. Are there other models out there? Um, and the answer is, yeah. I mean, there's actually a lot of different groups, sort maybe, of. Maybe let's not the examples, but just like, why do you think that that is, you know, a, a good model to use compared to, you know, not to explicitly mention that. Just... Oh, um, yeah. So why is the DAT model a particularly good one to use? I mean, I think that that the way that we approached developing it was saying, you know, like I, I sort of offhandedly said before, um, organizational change is a field that is like at least a century old. So there's there's literally a hundred plus years of knowledge that we have as a species about how to get organizations to change. Um, the issue as I saw it, I think is that a lot of that effort surprise, surprise, was pushed towards the private sector, uh, or sorry, the, yeah, the private sector, right, industry, um, because those are the people who were paying the bills, right, and so most organizational change work has been around, like, you know, well, if you think about Henry Ford, like, and, and uh, 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 assembly lines, right, or, um, you know, how do we, how do we get, uh, I don't know, IBM to innovate better or whatever, um, that effort has, or that, 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 that sort of intellectual work, it's only relatively recently that that's been sort of turned towards higher ed, right? And to say like, okay, well, how do we take all of the stuff that we've learned about how organizations change in the private sector and apply that to the higher ed context, which is super different, right? Like this is a whole nother thing I can talk about, but universities are really weird. <laughs> like there is a reason why I don't know if you've had the experience of, you know, like I was the first in my family even to go to college. So once I got to grad school, I very much struggled even trying to explain to my parents, like what the hell happens at a university? Like none of it makes any sense if you actually try to talk to people outside the bubble. Um, and so there's a, there was this real like translation work that had to be done to be like, okay, well this would work in Coca-Cola, right? So what is the version of that that is going to fit into the academic context, given that we are such a different environment. Um, so I don't know if that's an actual answer to your question, but like I think that that's that was sort of the approach that we took early on was to say there's all these good ideas. How do we translate that into into the higher ed context? And honestly, that's what a lot of the other work, um, the other folks who are sort of in this higher ed organizational change space are doing really similar things. Anything else? Yeah. So we talked a lot about uh, the amount of really thought and care that goes into creating like goals and set outcomes that want to achieve. Um, so you also mentioned that another goal is to create like lasting, sustained change. Yeah. So how do you make sure that the, the change that you implement through these new programs that you stay in? Yeah. So the question was um, essentially, how do you make sustainability happen? Um, and yeah, that's hard, uh, as is all the rest of this. Um, one piece that's really important is like explicitly, is just even being explicit about that as a thing you need to care about, right? So just totally forgetting about sustainability is one of the first ways that people, uh, you know, that, that, that failure along those lines happens. Um, Yeah, and, I, and in thinking about the teams that we've worked with, a lot of what that's meant in practice is thinking about what are either structures that already exist in the department or what are new structures that we can create that can take on the work that needs to be done to keep whatever ideas we've created going. Because departments do have committees, right? I mean, there's curriculum committees and recruitment committees. I mean, there's committees up the wazoo. Um, and people often can complain about committees not being particularly functional in departments, but at least most of the time they can like carry out tasks, right? And so um, if there's a way to say like, you know, we now have this assessment plan, where, who are the people in the department or where are the places in the department where we can have particular pieces of that being implemented and we know that it's just gonna happen every year, right? 
So I think that's a big piece of it is thinking about what are either structures that already exist or structures that we can create where these tasks can be handed off to them and they can just sort of run um, so that it can be routinized, right? Um, the thing that that doesn't do is to ensure that like the creative work is continuing to happen. And that piece is a little bit harder, right? Because what you also don't wanna have happen is for something to become so routine that it becomes ossified and eventually just sort of like useless, right? Cause it's a thing we do, but nobody knows why and nobody remembers what we're supposed to do with it, et cetera. Um, so that piece is a little bit harder. Uh, and I think probably the answer to that is you have to sort of keep going through that cycle. You sort of can't just stop at some point because change is a process, not an event. Yeah. Other? Any other questions? All right, if not, let's thank our speaker one more time. Thank <laughs> you.